I'd like to introduce you to Professor Linda Richards. She is joining us from the US. Um, she is very involved with the IRC5, the International Research Committee, as well as the Australian um, uh, DCC charity, OSDOC. And she's obviously doing extensive research on brain development and plasticity. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, and thank you uh, for having me. Um, hello, I can I actually can see the audience, so this, this is wonderful, and I see uh, some of my uh, colleagues there. So it's really uh, great to be with you. Um, I actually haven't used Teams before, so I am going to try and share my screen here and hope that uh, you'll be able to see some slides. Mm -hmm. Nope. Okay. So I'm sorry, I'll just it'll just take me a minute to get this up. Uh, maybe you, it says I'm sharing, but I don't know if can you see my slides? No. No. Okay, I see Lynn shaking her head. Um No, I'm actually not sure how to share my slides. Is there a somebody that, there who can tell me how to share the slides on here? Um, Nope, it just closes the window. Um, I think, well, uh, I guess I could talk without slides. Or if we can use Zoom. Uh, that would actually work better for me. Can you hear us? I can hear you, yeah, thank you. So, Linda, we can see your desktop. So I wonder, can you not oh. maximize and then uh, put it on, on slideshow? I can, yes, thank you. I think that was the problem. I can't see what you can see. All right, yeah. now can we, you we can, can see, you see my slide? diffusion color coded diffusion map that's, that's scrolling through at the moment. Okay, and you you can see the presenter mode or the slides. Uh, we can see the uh, yeah the slide the, the slideshow. We can't see your notes or anything like that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, well, have any here? But yeah, that's fantastic. All right, thank you very much. I'm sorry for the um, bit of a snafu there. Uh, so. Um, I'm a scientist, I'm not a doctor, uh, and uh, so it's wonderful that you've heard from so many um, uh, clinicians this morning. Um, you also, I think, heard from one of my uh, collaborators and former trainees, um, Dr. Joe Barnby as well, so I work very closely with Joe. Um, so today's talk, I, I'm going to cover a few current challenges in corpus callosum disorders. Um, how variable are corpus callosum disorders? And I'm going to borrow some slides from one of our colleagues who I think was at the meeting in London, um, Dr. Paul Lockhart, on how we can understand a genetic diagnosis and how corpus genes cause corpus callosum disorders. So um, the current challenge in corpus callosum disorders in this field is that they really are very vastly variable in their range of structural, genetic, and cognitive characteristics. And I'm sure all of you are aware of how variable um, they are. Uh, this makes the challenge of understanding and treating them vastly difficult for individuals with corpus callosum disorders, their families, their doctors, and for us scientists trying to understand uh, what causes corpus callosum disorders. So um, 
Another challenge that I uh, encounter in speaking with families is that often doctors can provide a structural diagnosis, but they often don't really know what that will mean for you. Now, I was fortunate um, to just hear um, Dr. Arici's uh, presentation. They, that is a very comprehensive program that he outlined. It's, it sounds absolutely fantastic. Also, the fact that um, that their their clinic is tracking children up until um, 24 months is amazing, and that is definitely not available to many families around the world that are um, that have a, a a child with a corpus callosum disorder. So that that's wonderful. I think what we would really love to see and advocate for is that the that um, that tracking actually progressed all the way through to adulthood and then intermittently during adulthood as well. Because the the you I'm sure that um, Dr. Paul has talked to you about how um, corpus callosum disorders really continue to affect people throughout their lives and in, in varying and many different ways. Uh, so often doctors don't know exactly how to treat your specific corpus callosum disorder symptoms or those of your child. Um, and they often use therapies that work better for other conditions, and these may be very appropriate. So uh, Dr. Arici talked about some uh, uh, work going on in cerebral palsy, and for children with movement disorders, those would be the state-of-the-art uh, therapies that would be uh, best for those children. Um, Similarly, uh, if the child is diagnosed with autism, uh, some of those therapies may be employed as well. And we understand those perhaps much better than um, corpus callosum disorders and the very specifics that are um, for, for corpus callosum disorders. Um, but many families often find that their doctor is unable to provide much guidance or prognosis because currently that kind of information is not yet available. And that is where scientists are trying to understand more about these disorders. So the scientific challenge and why are scientists interested in corpus callosum disorders, scientists like myself? So we are interested in them from a number of perspectives. So firstly, uh, we are interested in what the corpus callosum actually does. Um, it is a huge fibre tract, a highway that connects both hemispheres together. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about, um, about that in a moment. But we are interested just fundamentally in what the corpus callosum is actually, um, what it actually does in cognition, how the corpus callosum under, underpins different brain functions and cognition, and how much does this change throughout life? How do corpus callosum disorders first arise? And this is an area I've spent a lot of um, my uh, career working on. And how does the corpus callosum develop? What are the genes that are involved and how do these genes function? And what other conditions are associated with corpus callosum disorders and why? And these questions lie at the heart of scientists striving to understand fundamentally how the brain develops and how it functions. And many of the people that you may have heard from today who are corpus callosum specialists also do research. So they are a rare breed of individuals that are both scientists and doctors. So um, every brain contains unique information. And by that, I mean your memories, um, how you uh, learn, how you go about learning things, all of that information is actually stored in your brain. So can we really ever um, hope to understand how the brain works? And this is a question that um, also drives scientists and why studying people with corpus callosum disorders is um, both interesting to understand specifically corpus callosum disorders, but also this is contributing to a much bigger um, question about understanding how the brain works in general. 
And so, uh, so this uh, research is important from uh, a number of perspectives. And your amazing brain is divided up into different areas that subs subserve different functions for you every day. And here's the big one, memory, but also creativity, attention, the ability to read. And uh, we've put these just uh, loosely over the kinds of areas that are involved in these. But really, when you're doing all of these functions, many of these areas are involved. So you really have an incredible brain and they, all of these areas are connected by these wires that are called axons. So the brain has is made up of um, electrically excitable cells called neurons and they connect to each other via these long wires called an axon. And when the axon um, comes in contact with another neuron, it forms what's called a synapse or a, uh, a, a connection between two neurons. And so sometimes you will have heard the term synaptic plasticity. And this occurs throughout life. These small connections change all throughout life as we're encoding information. There is another type of plasticity, and this is called long-range axonal plasticity. So this occurs only during development, and this is where um, axons, as they're growing within the developing uh, baby's brain, they can actually take another route and form a different tract. So I'm going to show you some of those tracts in a moment. So our work as scientists is really directed towards how the brain is formed and wired up to function. And we use a number of different technologies to help us look inside the brain of uh, living people. This is one uh, you can see here an image um, tracking through an adult human brain where we have performed a uh, a computational program that allows us to see all of the different tracks within the brain. And the corpus callosum is shown up in red here. We can color code the tracks based on the orientation of the fibers. So those that are growing from left to right or have grown from left to right, like the corpus callosum, they're in red. And those ones that are traveling from front to back are in green and the ones going up and down are in blue. So this can give us a full map of the connectivity of the, um, that individual's brain in terms of structure. And you've heard a lot about the corpus callosum today, so I'm sure I don't need to show you what it is. But it really is a massive fiber tract. You can see it here where this is an adult brain and we remove the, the, um, the top of the brain here and you can see this massive fiber tract connecting the two hemispheres together. And in an MRI, it's very visible and easy to see here. And this is uh, slicing the brain uh, by MRI this way. And of course, you've also heard what um, and seen some pictures of agenesis of the corpus callosum where the corpus callosum um, axons fail to cross the midline. They are actually formed. Um, so out here, hopefully you can see my pointer. Um, out here in the gray matter where the neuron cell bodies lie, they then send their axon down towards the midline and they grow in these longitudinal bundles here instead of crossing the midline as they would here in the individual with a corpus callosum. You can see they're crossing the midline here, um, the middle part of the brain. But here, instead, they're growing from front to back. So uh, they did form, but they didn't cross the midline. So they cannot connect the two hemispheres together. Um, there's also uh, conditions uh, called partial agenesis of the corpus callosum. So complete is characterized by total absence of the crossing fibers of the corpus callosum. And partial agenesis is um, where there's a small remnant of the corpus callosum still remaining, but a large um, part of the corpus callosum is missing here. And um, in those individuals, they also have these longitudinal um, bundles of probes, they're called, P-R-O-B-S-T, 
you may see that in, on if you're Googling um, corpus callosum disorders. All right, and another type of corpus callosum disorder are these ones, hypoplasia of the corpus callosum. The, so that's where the corpus callosum is very thin. Um, you can also, not shown here, uh, see individuals with a thicker corpus callosum. So, and that's also uh, often associated with autism. So um, having the corpus callosum be just the right size is very important. And um, Dr. Ricci also uh, mentioned enlarged ventricles. This is a condition that's known as colpocephaly, colpocephaly, and it is very commonly associated with corpus callosum disorders. So we're looking at an adult brain here, and uh, it's sliced across um, this way in this image, and in this image, it's sliced this way. So you can see the corpus callosum fibers actually made it to the, the midline, but they failed to cross, and now they're forming these big bundles of probes that are growing down on either side of the midline. All right. So uh, using that tractography that I mentioned before, we can actually see these in a different way. So here are three images of uh, a normal corpus callosum or neurotypical corpus callosum, complete agenesis of the corpus callosum. So now the fibers are green because they're traveling from front to back. And here in this partial agenesis, you can see some fibers crossing, but some fibers also form these probes bundles. Now in these individuals, it has been described by some of our colleagues in the field that there can be ectopic tracts that actually are not normally seen in neurotypical individuals that connect different parts of the brain together. This one is known as a sigmoid bundle it's quite rare, but it does sometimes occur in people with partial agenesis of the corpus callosum. Now, we've studied a number, this is a very busy slide, but this is some work from our group, but also has been shown um, by a number of other groups. These are different people with partial agenesis of the corpus callosum shown here. And what we did was draw a little... Um, outline of the corpus callosum remnant here so you can see what they look like in different individuals and what we found and this is uh, similar to what uh, other people have found is that even though the remnant looks the same the connections between the two sides of the brain can be really vastly different so these uh, tractography images are showing um, some of these individuals here in different ways and you can see that they do actually look quite variable. So it's very hard to tell just from these. These are called um, T1 weighted anatomical MRI scans. It's very hard to tell from these exactly which areas of the brain are connected. And uh, even with this tractography, it's still quite a crude measure of which areas of the brain are connected. But one of the things that we are working with um, Dr. Paul and other members of the IRC5 on is trying to understand if this um, tractography and connectivity actually matches up with cognitive abilities um, that we see in people. Because if there was a correlation, and we, we're not sure if there is, but if there was a correlation, that would help us in terms of earlier diagnosis of potential cognitive issues that that person might have. So um, we are very interested in how do disorders of the corpus callosum occur and how do they affect people. And at the moment, our group works both with the OSDOC group in Australia and also with the National Organization for Disorders of the Corpus Callosum in the USA, where our lab is now located. Um, and uh, Dr. Barnby, who uh, was in my group in Australia and then moved to Royal Holloway, um, is now hoping to start some work with Corpal and yourselves um, as part of our ongoing um, collaboration, also with um, Dr. Rhonda Booth. So I wanted to... And so... 
sorry. I heard something, but all right. I wanted to move on now and just talk about understanding a genetic diagnosis and um, what that actually means. So um, why identify the genetic cause of a brain condition? This is really um, the, the basis of the first step required for personalised medicine to be able to tailor treatments and therapies to the specific cause in each individual. And our goal would be to um, really be able to provide this kind of information for everybody. Um, it's still very much an ongoing um, uh, endeavour that the whole field has at the moment. But a genetic diagnosis provides um, often an answer for the family uh, in terms of um, trying to figure out what has happened. Uh, a prognostic information for the family, and again, this is something that our research with the IRC5 would um, hope to be able to do, and that is to provide better prognostic information for families. Ability to provide genetic counselling and reproductive choice for those who want it and potential to develop targeted treatments based on knowledge. So it is... Um, and so why is Gen X so powerful whoops, right now? This and is actually Paul, who's... So what is on, DNA? Um, DNA is what provides the instructions for life. All right. Um, there are three main... So, well, the second mechanism... I'd like. All right. Well, maybe we can hit, listen to Paul because he put a um, audio over the top of these. So... Let me just go back. And where he is speaking, I will stop speaking. So um, the genetics is so powerful because the Human Genome Project um, was completed. Uh, it was initiated in 1990 and finished in 2003. And it read all three billion letters um, of the genetic code. It took 15 years. Now, um, there has been incredible... So what is DNA? DNA is what provides the instructions for life. It's the instruction code within the cell, which is made up of four different letters, A, C, G, and T. Every human cell contains pretty much exactly the same DNA sequence. And there are approximately 3 billion letters organised into 23 strings, which are called chromosomes. The order of the letters determines the information to build and maintain a person. And so similar to how letters of the alphabet make words and sentences, the different letters within DNA make up the gene. And the DNA encodes approximately 25,000 genes, each of which provides the instructions for one single protein. And it's these proteins that are the building blocks of the cell and your body. It's helpful to note at this stage that every cell in your body contains two copies of each gene. So who's speaking now is Dr. Paul. So a genetic condition occurs when the DNA instructions are wrong. So health conditions can be caused by genetic or non-genetic means. An example of a non-genetic health condition, of course, is COVID-19, where infection by the virus causes health symptoms such as respiratory problems and body aches. Conversely, an example of a genetic condition, once relatively common, is cystic fibrosis. And in this condition, an alteration of one letter in one of the two genes encoding a protein, which is called CFTR, causes respiratory problems and a life-threatening disorder. More than 6,000 genetic conditions have been identified to date and more have been reported every year. What's interesting is that for almost half of these, the gene causing the condition is yet to be identified. There are three main classes of genetic conditions. I'm going to spend a little bit of time describing each one as understanding these mechanisms can be important to understand how genetic health conditions might impact an individual and members of an individual's family. So the first mechanism to describe is the de novo mechanism, and that's illustrated here in this cartoon. In this situation, 
non-parent manifests with a genetic condition. And in both of the parents, the DNA sequence is what we would consider to be normal. But what does happen is that a mutation or a change in DNA occurs in either the egg or the sperm, either before fertilization or immediately afterwards. And so in an affected offspring, every cell in their body now contains DNA, which has a change compared to both of their parents. It's important to note that there is a very small chance that multiple children in this family will manifest the same genetic condition because this is not coming from the parents. It's a random event that's happened during the development of either the sperm or the egg. The second mechanism I'd like to describe are autosomal recessive genetic conditions. And I mentioned previously that everyone has two copies of each gene. In an autosomal recessive condition, each parent has a DNA change or a mutation in one of the two copies of a single gene. Therefore, neither parent presents with a health condition. However, there is a 50% chance that any single sperm or egg produced by these individuals will have the genetic alteration. So in terms of children, there are three potential outcomes. In the first instance, the child inherits a mutation from both the sperm and the egg. This means that the child will have two folded copies of the gene and they will be affected by a genetic disorder. The second potential outcome is that the child does not inherit any mutation from either the sperm or the egg, and they are unaffected. And the third potential outcome is that the child inherits one copy of the mutation from either the sperm or the egg, and they are like their parents, a carrier of the change, but not affected by it. As you can see, there is a 25% chance of an affected child if both parents are carriers of a autosomal recessive genetic change. The final mechanism I need to describe is an autosomal dominant genetic condition. And this is somewhat similar to the autosomal recessive mechanism in the sense that the DNA variant or mutation is coming from a parent. However, in this case, a single variant in one of the two copies of a gene is sufficient to cause a disease or genetic health condition. So in the example illustrated, the father has a mutation in one copy of a gene, and this is sufficient to cause disease. Therefore, 50% of his sperm will carry this change also. And what that means is that half of his children will inherit two normal copies of the gene and be unaffected, whereas half will inherit the mutation and manifest the same condition as the father. Another form is uh, called somatic mosaicism. So this is a variation of the de novo mutation situation, but it occurs after the single cell stage of the embryo. So um, it, it means that not all organs will be affected. Only some cells in the body might be affected in this case. And these um, somatic mosaicisms can be uh, chromosomal. So as um, Dr. Arici was explaining, could be the whole book, or it could be a single nucleotide polymorphism or a single base pair. And that means that the recipe is disrupted just based on some of the ingredients. Um, and this has been reported in many cases of brain conditions. Um, I'll let Paul continue. This project was quite controversial at the time, with a number of people calling it a complete waste of time, money and resources. However, having this blueprint has been fundamental to the amazing advances in diagnostics, treatment and therapies across the entire health spectrum subsequent to completion of the project. And while knowledge of the code has formed the foundation of these advances, they've been facilitated by incredible advances in technology and computing power. 
And there are three, now three key tools that we use to understand the genetic basis of a disorder. Now I'll describe each of these briefly as they're important to understand some of the subsequent presentations that you'll hear. The first tool I want to describe is called microarray analysis. And this technology doesn't specifically read the DNA code. Instead, what it does is very rapidly scan the entire genome and ask if any genes are present in an abnormal number. So rather than the usual two copies of each gene, are any present in only one copy or three or more copies? And this is a very cheap and rapid technology that can identify approximately 10% of all genetic conditions. It's usually deployed as a frontline first test performed in the process of identifying the genetic basis of a condition. The second technology is called whole exome sequencing. And again, this technique, like microarray, does not interrogate all three billion letters of the genetic code. Instead, it reads only the genes themselves. In the schematic shown, the genes are shown in red, while intervening non-gene DNA is in black. Approximately 70% of genetic conditions are caused by errors in the instructions of a gene. And because these only make up approximately 2% of the 3 billion letters, it is relatively cheap and quick to analyse only this subset of our genome. And essentially what we do <coughs> is we have methods whereby we can just isolate the specific DNA that makes up these genes, removing it from the rest of the non-gene DNA, and then specifically sequence that subset of approximately 2% of the genome itself. The final technology is called whole genome sequencing, and this is the showstopper. Essentially, this is replicating the Human Genome Project and sequencing all three billion letters of an individual's genetic code. As I mentioned, this is a relatively new technology facilitated by computational power and automation at scale. And where we're at now is that it's possible for $1,000 in an overnight experiment to sequence all, to read all three billion letters of the genetic code. And that compares very favourably to the original Human Genome Project, which cost $3 billion and took over 15 years. Despite all these amazing tools and technologies, there are still some challenges in performing whole genome sequencing and genetic diagnosis. Genetic disorders are often caused by a single letter change in the 3 billion letter genetic code. And so finding that single change is equivalent to finding one single letter typo in approximately 1,000 copies of War and Peace or 300 copies of the entire Harry Potter series. An additional issue is that every individual listening to this talk differs from other individuals at about 3 million letters. And what we call, what this is called is genetic noise. And so it can be very difficult to find that single one change among three million changes on average that is responsible for a genetic condition. However, we now have an unprecedented ability to identify the genetic basis of most genetic conditions. And now we're able to tackle some of the really difficult disorders. And I hope that in the next few talks, you'll hear more about that from Christelle, Tanya and Elliot. Okay, so that was a talk uh, presented by um, Dr. Paul Lockhart remotely for the NODCC conference, but I thought it'd be very helpful to show you that here because he nicely outlines um, the different causes of genetic um, disorders and also some of the main technologies that you might hear about. Um, this is a slide he also provided which shows some of the commonly disrupted genes in corpus callosum disorders but there really are so very many genes involved in corpus callosum disorders. So why are there so many genes involved in disorders of the corpus callosum? And that is because forming a corpus callosum is very complex. And 
So if we look at early brain development, which helps to form the wiring of the brain, which of course underpins cognitive function, we know that at least 400 genes are involved in forming a corpus callosum, at least 400 genes. So how can we figure out what these genes actually do? Because identifying the gene is again step one, but what do they do? How can we study genes in corpus callosum development? The only way that we really can study them uh, is to do experiments in the lab. And we do experiments with animals like mice. And mice, we can introduce the same kind of genetic mutation that might be seen in a person with corpus callosum disorder. And we can then study the brain of the mouse to see how this gene mutation has actually um, impacted the formation of the corpus callosum. So interestingly, mice also have a corpus callosum and they have corpus callosum agenesis. So this is a mouse um, showing a normal corpus callosum here. And here is a mouse with agenesis of the corpus callosum. And they also have these probes bundles, these longitudinal bundles that I showed you before. So what you're seeing here is a mouse brain sliced this way. And this is actually a nicer picture of a mouse brain. They have a smooth brain here. And what we've done here is use a technique to label some cells in the upper part of the cerebral cortex of the mouse. And then uh, these are where most of the cell bodies of the neurons that form the corpus callosum, both in humans and in mice, reside. And so we can label some of those uh, with this um, special fluorescent protein. And what you can see are the corpus callosum axons traversing to the other side and projecting into the other hemisphere. And what these um, experiments do is we can introduce the mutation into um, these cells and then see how it might do either disrupt the um, the formation of the axon or its pathway or how it makes synaptic connections in the other hemisphere. So something we do know is that not only are the neurons really important, these are the ones that have the axon, but there are other cell types in the brain that are also very important for the corpus callosum to form. And these are called glia. Glia surround different fibre tracts in the brain, and in particular, those fibre tracts that cross over the midline. So in this part of the mouse brain, and this is exactly the same in human brain as well, we've labelled the colossal axons here in red, and you can see the glial cells in green here, and they surround all, all around the corpus callosum. And in work in our lab, we know of a, a family of genes that are crucially important for forming these glia, for example. So people that have um, a mutation in the nuclear factor one genes have corpus callosum disorders. That's just one of the many of the 400 genes that are involved. Some other genes that are involved are ones that help guide the axons across the midline during those early stages of development. And this occurs through the expression of some receptors um, that can receive signals that are on the growth cone, the tip of the growing axon when it's forming the corpus callosum. And the glial cells actually produce signals that um, uh, tell these growth cones which way to grow. And these signals, this is a picture here that just reminds me to tell you that these signals are the same in worms, flies, fish, frogs, chick, mouse, and human. All the way through evolution, these molecules have been used over and over again in forming the nervous system of all of these animals and people. Um, and so we can, this is why studying animals is a great model for understanding human disorders, because many of the mechanisms are highly conserved. So what do we know about the cause of corpus callosum agenesis? So the key here is actually 
Um, so here in MRI, you can see the corpus callosum and a person with complete agenesis of the corpus callosum here. And now we're slicing the brain this way. And you can see the callosal fibers crossing over from one side to the other here. And here are those longitudinal bundles here and here. What's key in this image is this small piece of tissue that sits below the corpus callosum. It's called the septum. And you can see how this septum, the two sides of the septum, they're called the septal leaves, splay apart in somebody with a corpus callosum disorder. Whereas in this individual, the two septal leaves are fused together. So we um, observed this in a large cohort of um, people with corpus callosum disorders in our collaborator, Dr. Elliot Scher's lab at the University of California, San Francisco. And um, what we found in screening through his MRI images was that 100% of people with complete agenesis of the corpus callosum have this enlarged interhemispheric uh, fissure, it's called. So this is the kind of split between the two hemispheres that's there. And it's much larger because the, um, the septum didn't fuse and the corpus callosum could not cross. So in early brain development, this is what a mouse brain looks like. This is what a human brain looks like. You can see the two hemispheres are separated together here. And uh, But early on, they're actually one hemisphere that becomes two hemispheres. And as they do this, um, uh, an extra piece of the brain actually has to fuse together to provide a substrate for the growing corpus callosum axons to cross over the midline. So in human brain, this is now human brain uh, from a, a gestational week 13 fetus, where we have actually sectioned the brain and stained it for um, glial markers. And what you can see here are at an early stage of development, the two hemispheres are separated. So this little square is this one here. And uh, there are glia lining up on either side. And these are called midline zipper glia because they actually zipper up the midline of the septum. So at gestational week 14, you can see that they're actually zippering the midline together and they provide a bridge, a substrate or bridge for the corpus callosum axons to actually cross over the midline. Yeah. And so this, uh, this occurs, these glia, which are seen, let's just look at the schematic here in red, they are initially um, formed along the different edges of the two hemispheres of the brain, but they begin to then intercalate together. They have a morphological change that allows this fusion to occur. So um, this is some schematics just showing you that there are specialized glia that come from a very central point in the brain that migrate forward and form these midline zipper glia. And if this occurs normally, like here, there's a substrate there and the colossal axons can cross the midline. If these glia don't migrate forward and don't um, uh, bridge this, these two hemispheres together, the corpus callosum axons can't cross. There's nothing for them to grow over. So they form these probes bundles or longitudinal bundles that we showed you before. So um, that is how complete agenesis of the corpus callosum occurs. It's also very similar in partial agenesis of the corpus callosum, and we know many of the genes that are involved in both of those processes. But how is disorder, a disorder of the corpus callosum plus another disorder possible? This is because a basic process is disrupted that's important for both corpus callosum development and general brain development. So in this individual, they have um, changes in their uh, cerebral cortex folds here. So this is a condition called polymicrogyria, and it actually can be a cause of epilepsy. 
And that's because um, some of the processes that go into forming the folds of the corpus callosum and the migration of the neurons are also involved in this process of these glial cells migrating forward to form the bridge. So both the bridge was disrupted and the um, individual also had these um, changes in the cerebral cortex. There are also some genes that regulate the corpus callosum and other organ systems. So then in those individuals, they may have both a corpus callosum disorder, they may also have a heart disorder um, or problem, a kidney problem. They could have the pituitary problem that Dr. Ricci talked about in one of his patients. <clears throat> um, so they may have um, uh, other organ system problems because this same gene can sometimes regulate multiple organ systems. And so how can we gain new knowledge to help understand corpus callosum disorders? Really the key here is science to discover how these genes actually function to make progress. And by progress, we mean understanding, understanding the what, what happened, why, and how, and we usually measure and quantify and provide evidence of this. It also could be understanding the cognitive implications of what happens. And having that understanding, we can provide evidence. And with that evidence, we can actually uh, promote new effective treatments and outcomes that would actually work. So doctors and therapists and allied health professionals implement these treatments and hopefully these are evidence-based treatments, of course, um, because if you don't understand what's wrong, you can't treat it with evidence-based effective therapies. Otherwise, we're just making a stab in the dark. So this is why the International Research Consortium is so important. Um, and so myself and colleagues here, and Dr. Paul, I know, is in the audience, um, got together and have formed this international consortium so that we can share knowledge amongst scientists. And throughout each of these programs, um, we are employing genetic approaches, um, not just with Elliot Scher, but many other people in the IRC5. There are also groups doing different types of MRI imaging, like the ones I showed today, and also neuropsychology and cognitive neuroscience, like the kind of work that um, Dr. Paul would have talked about and Dr. Bandi talked about as well. And then there are, of course, animal models that we use to understand how these all fit together. So uh, that is the end of my presentation. And I just wanted here to um, thank the individuals that were involved uh, from my lab uh, here. And um, uh, we have a, also an international group here because I moved my lab from Australia to, uh, to the US. I'm still collaborating with my colleague in Australia, Professor Gail Robinson, who's a cognitive and um, clinical neuropsychologist. And with uh, Dr. Joe Barnby here, who's now started his own group in Royal Holloway in London. And we also uh, collaborate with Professor Peter Diane in Germany, who is an expert in um, human cognition and computational approaches. So if you would like to learn more, you please contact us. You can contact us on our email, Corpus Callosum Research at uh, Worcester, so that's washu, St. Louis, edu. You can sign up for our newsletter, which we put out that um, helps to keep everybody up to date with our latest research. And there is also more resources on our website. So thank you very much. And so, Professor Richards, thank you so much for such a, a great presentation. Really interesting to know the genetics behind this and um, the factors that influence uh, this condition. Um, and obviously all the amazing research and science behind this. Um, any questions from the audience? No? Lovely. Okay, thank you so much.
We will we will end the call. Thank you so much. We'll we'll follow that. All right. That Thank, email. You Thank you. Great to be with you. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you so much. Lovely. Um, oh, we don't need to see all that. <laughs> they are in person. <laughs> um, okay, so that gets us a little bit closer to the end, but it's not the end yet. Um, I, I want to ask, first of all, do you have any questions from everything you've heard? Any comments? No? Okay. So what we will do now is that we have Professor Brown, we have Dr. Rhonda Booth, and we have Jasmine Turner, um, where they will be in this room and between here and the coffee place outside. If families, you parents want to ask any personal questions, more private questions, you don't want to raise them um, in, in the wider room, you can have a conversation with them, ask them, um, see what they have to say, um, and thereafter we'll make our way around, I don't know, what's the time now? Five past five, isn't it? Yeah. Was that, sorry? Ten to five, okay, so we'll try to be, let's say, 5.20, between 5.20 and 5.30 if we can make our way to the European room for dinner. Um, before we do that, I want to say thank you for attending today. Um, I would like to follow up the conference with a questionnaire um, shortly after because I want to know what you think we did well and what you think we can do better for next time, um, what your feedback is, what was useful, um, what we can change for next time. You're following me. I didn't realize it's following me. <laughs> Um, and as I said at the beginning, take this as an opportunity to think of Corpal. Do you want to become a member of the team? Do you want to become a volunteer, a trustee? You know, we need help. So anything you can do, your time, your energy will be greatly appreciated. Um, so with that, I'll bring the meeting to an end. But as I said, we have the family discussions taking place and then dinner. So thank you very much for coming today. I hope you really enjoyed it and I hope it was what you expected or even better. <laughs>